everyone, welcome to Wide Open Throttle, and we've got an action-packed Motor Trend versus Hot Rod edition here. We've got Ed Lowe, Editor-in-Chief of Motor Trend, and Johnny Lehman, Senior Editor from Motor Trend, and of course joining us, the guys from Roadkill and Hot Rod Magazine, David Freiberger and Mike Finnegan. So we're going to start off with something that's right in the wheelhouse of the Hot Rod guys, Pagani Hawaira. These one-of-a-kind million-dollar supercars coming out of a tiny little workshop in, in Italy are pretty fantastic cars. I've driven one, and Johnny, you got to drive Horatio's latest. I did. Well, you saw if you've seen the video, you know how I feel. I mean, it, it's, it's, I think now it has replaced the 458 Italia as the actual best car I've ever driven. The best car in the world, right? I would say so. You know, it was, it was. But have you driven all of the cars? I've driven a lot of the cars. But I, I was talking to, with uh, our friend Dan Neal, and you know, and he said about the wire. He said, you know, it's pretty much the best car in the world, right? And I said, yeah. I mean, it it is. I don't. <laughs> I can't think of anything wrong with it aside from the 1.4 million dollar price. For what reason? I mean, and as you said it, uh, it it's, it's one man's singular vision of what a hypercar should be. So like, if, uh, if there's lights on the dash, come on, they're unique. He didn't, like nothing except for the engine, which is AMG, and he totally admits that, but nothing in that car is found in any, any other car. It has wings, it has four wings on it. And, and just like an airplane, there's a button to test the wings, and it goes into a whole like, free flight check mode, where the whole dash runs through this. When the wings move, they changed, allegedly changed the aerodynamic load on the corners of the car compared to, to how you're steering, but you know, the, Every single detail on this car is down to this guy. It's like it's like a hot, it's like a hot the ultimate hot rodder. These guys are going dorks like they, as, <laughs> as we're just as you're describing wings. They're like yeah. Right. Sounds like the world's greatest kit car to me. I watched a video about it. There's things about it I dig. Yeah. But you know I I went up to with your with your kit car. Uh, I went up to Horatio and he has, he speaks through a translator. And I, I said you know I was expecting a fast spiker. I was expecting a kit car, and it totally isn't. And the guy wouldn't even translate that. He's like, he's like, I can't, I can't say fast can't spiker. You can't, you can't say kit car or fast spiker. He doesn't want to hear that. Yeah. The translator would have got choked out. Yeah, but it, but it's, it's not a kit car. I mean, it's it, like you know, the, the one we drove, I think, had 88,000 kilometers on it, and we beat on it, and it was flawless. You but know? Uh, thinking about what you're saying about the car, is it actually what you would call a production car or is it truly a hot rodder building a handful of cars in his garage? He's doing 35 a year. So His garage is cooler than our garage. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you were talking about what, uh, $85,000 bolts, right? Like titanium no, bolts, I, okay, so, custom so, hex pattern. So there's 1,300 bolts that make up the car. They're all titanium. It's his own custom pattern. They all say Pagani on them. And I heard this rumor, and I said to Luca, the PR guy, I said, I heard these are 80,000 euros a set, which is like 100 grand. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, that's the pre-production bolts. The actual price is 65,000 euros a set. <laughs> you know? just, so. just for the bolts. I mean, <laughs> it's an interesting car. I'd, I'd, you'd, I'd like to drive it back to back with you know, something um, like the, you know, the nine, new 918 or the uh, LaFerrari and, uh, um, and just see whether it is that good. But when I first I drove a Zonda 10 years ago, when I drove the early Wira, um, it does feel complete. It turns properly. It feels really light. It's very, very fast because it, it doesn't weigh much. It's what, a little bit over. Well, they claim it's 3,000, yeah. but I mean, you know, we have to weigh it. But that, I mean, that interior, is, it's so like, like, Steampunk, like crazy, out of control. It's not only is it steampunk, but it's like it's like the quality of the aluminum work and the, the leather. I was talking to a guy from AMG, and he goes, you know, he goes that quality of leather, that grade, that's handbag. Like we, AMG can't even order that kind of leather. This is like a hundred thousand euros of leather just for the the cabin of that car. It's comfortable. The ergos so, are good, and it's like well, no, the seats know? cost more than my. I've truck. driven a Spiker. <laughs> wow. Okay, you, but we, okay. Remember, remember the, the the Black Series, the SLS Black Series, right? It's great car. It's going, but you know it's a little hard to get in and out of and stuff like that. So so on the Pagani, the entire side of the car is a going. The whole side comes up, so anybody can get into and get out of it. His, his attention to detail is, is amazing, and you can go into that factory and walk around and just look at the cars while they're being built. I mean, whole uprights for the, each suspension upright and wheel carriers all um, machined out of solid billets of um, aircraft quality aluminum. I mean, every single piece on this car is a work of art. He, Horatio Pagani's a, a really charismatic character. He's, 
I think he's almost channeling Enzo Ferrari and Michelangelo. Yeah. Uh, he kept mentioning Da Vinci. He sees himself as a modern sort of Renaissance man who instead of you know, painting the Sistine Chapel or carving marble statues is building cars. He does hot rod shops that build stuff to that level and they can cost two million dollars. Thing is, I don't think they perform, which is the sad thing. <laughs> no, they you just know. Cool. Yeah, this, this. I mean, look, we, we, we. Supposedly, we're going to get one. We're going to be able to test it. They want us to do our full normal motor trend stuff with it. Um, but this thing is fast. I mean, it's. You know, I don't. It's always hard to get the exact numbers, but it's like 760 horsepower, 730 some odd pound feet of torque. Doesn't weigh anything. Single clutch transmission, which, which you know, around town isn't as great as a dual clutch, but once you're going, I mean, bang, bang, bang. It's, I don't know. I, I, I was looking for a flaw, and it might be around town. It's a little clunky. I think, I think we smell a, a rat rod versus Wyra. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure Ferrari will loan you a car to compare, right? <laughs> totally. Absolutely. <laughs> Zing. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember being in Boyd Coddington's shop about 25 years ago, and you had a, a build a, a black uh, 32 replica that had uh, wide tires all around, and a, um, I think it had a, a, a blown small block in it at the time. And he said, this car will lap Willow Springs faster than a Porsche 928. And I'm sure they never <laughs> even fired it up. Well, I just wanted that was suspension, that. right? Yeah. 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 OK, that's enough about uh, Modena. Let's talk about Montana, which, according to the schedule, is where you guys are headed for the next I episode of Roadkill. <laughs> you believe what you read? <laughs> You've it's seen the, the Roadkill schedule is uh, a lot like throwing darts at a map. Yeah, we went to San Jose. What? <laughs> very close, very close. Literally, we had a, a plan that wasn't man Montana that then fell through, and then Finnegan comes up with, like that, some guy on Facebook who hooked us up with uh, what we're going to do for the next show. Yeah, so a guy on Facebook who was apparently a roadie for the band Poison nice. now has a vineyard with a hot rod shop attached to it, and that's not even where we went. <laughs> he knew of a car in San Jose that he was going to go get, and he said it needed all kinds of work, and I'm going to go out there and fix it and drive it back to my shop. And I said, well, we're idiots, so you know, we'll do that for you for free, because that's fun for us. <laughs> yeah. Did you take the Chevy flatbed? No, oh, no, that would have driving. been smart. <laughs> no, we take stuff that doesn't run and drive and fix it and actually drive right, it. Right, right. And this car is a Mercury Custom that was bad. It wasn't Rat Rod Jeep bad, but it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. Well, yeah, It was a 50, 49 or 50 Merc, we're not sure, that somebody put. Well, it was a coupe before the guy saw all the roof off. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah like you do. <laughs> no roof and sitting on a 72 Chevelle chassis, which is probably the only good part about this car. It's <laughs> actually what saved our bacon, because yeah. <laughs> it wasn't hand-fabricated suspension. Yeah. But wouldn't a yeah. Chevelle be significantly both longer and wider than a Well, no, it's 40. shorter. Yeah, it's shorter, so the guy had actually extended the frame with, like, you know, railroad girders and stuff. It was... The, the engineering it reminded me of that rat rod Jeep. I remember watching that video being horrified at the um, integrity of the front suspension. I think it was the liability that horrified you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had my corporate hat on. I was just thinking, oh, my God, I hope the guys in head office never watch this video. I don't know if that was the stupidest stories, thing ever. But... I literally ran two different cops off the road in that thing yeah, without getting pulled over. Got behind us? I don't want to look. No, no. Is there any chrome I can look in a reflection to see if he's behind us? No. Welcome to my peripheral vision. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's holding up his camera. <laughs> That's not suspicious at all. Nice work. So wait, wait, back to the Merc. So there was, there was a... There's a crime thing? There's a oh, Italian so, mobster? What's the kind so, of oh, sorry. so the full story, I'll try to give you the abbreviated version, is this guy, a chiropractor guy, um, buys it off eBay, or Craigslist, I'm not sure, hasn't really seen it, and sends it to Gambino Customs in uh, San Jose, that Gambino. Okay. Yeah. Um, nicest guy you'll ever meet. Uh -huh. Just don't piss him off. And. Uh, and so we get, we get there, and we find this 49 or 50 Merc that's got plug wires crisscrossed, I think, oil leaks everywhere, just it had issues. And so we spend two or three days making it run to drive it back to Poison Roadie Guy with the vineyard. In Paso Robles. In Paso Robles. Right. Yeah. So I'm just trying to imagine the literary quality of the Craigslist ad. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, pictures look wonderful. You're a magazine guy. You know how to oh, <laughs> make oh, photo look yeah. good. <laughs> it's custom. Yeah. Okay. I'm just. I'm just in my head. It's really. It's really funny. It's. Really you know what? The show. It's weird trying to talk about it because it doesn't sound that good. But actually, in doing it, we had a lot of fun. We visited my buddies at Hot Rod Ranch in Lompoc or Lompoc or you know Lompoc. Bo Boondock, California, and did burnouts and. There's a lot of stuff in the episode. Is it? Oh, that's right. Yeah. So how do you, um, when you see someone's vision of, you know, someone has obviously cared enough to want to create their own car. We were talking about Horatio Pagani. Well, you've got a guy with a Mercury and a Chevy Vega. But, you know, he's put some thought into this. Uh, right, good good intentions, that, bad fabrication. What that's I mean, what this was. was. The there was like Fairmont's link. You know what I mean? If you're going to. A Chevelle chassis well, under a Mercury? Guys, Fairmont's the uh, unibody. It's worth a lot of money. The thing Just is, it, not how we found it. I actually wrote my column about this this month because when we first looked at this car, it was clapped. It was a pile. The workmanship is not. And I was thinking to myself the whole time, how am I going to explain to this guy who spent way too much money for this car over the internet how bad it really is? But because that was the thing, is we were delivering the car from one shop to another where the new owner was going right. to see it for the, really the first time. For the first time. And as we drove the thing, I actually came up with a dozen good things I could fairly say to the guy about the car. But when we got there, and this guy was thrilled to death, and his kid was bouncing off the walls, and he says to me, I know it's a, a pile, but it doesn't matter, because it makes me happy. It's like, OK. It was great. It really sort of turned my opinion on sort of the, the human interest side of hot rodding, where if you don't care and you can have fun, go yeah. for it. Oh, that's totally cool. It's just, it's just. So is hot rodding more about you like, you like building cars rather than driving cars? Because they never seem to go very far, do they? <laughs> There's all sorts of different guys in the hot rodding world. There's people who like to build. There's people who like to buy and flip. Um, you know, I'm into performance. I like actually running them and then don't <laughs> leave them parked. It is. It's very much a hobby of parking cars and tinkering with them and dreaming about what you're someday going to do. Has there ever been a car that you've looked at and said, I wish I'd built that? Or is that Troy Chapanier's uh, um, Talladega. Oh, it's too nice. Uh, no, it is way too nice. If it, he had this car, it's built. It's a '69 Talladega, yeah. and it's the most incredible hot rodder built car I've ever been in. As far as fit, finish, it has an all sheet metal interior, and it doesn't rattle a bit. Uh -huh. You know, it has a single overhead cam motor in the thing. It's just, it's an incredible car. That in bare primer, I could drive. Okay, talking about you know one of a kind cars and unusual opportunities. Let's shift gear a bit and talk about an auction that happened. Uh, last Lambrex Chevy in the middle of nowhere, but it seemed to make waves all over America among the, oh. the enthusiasts. Captured the imagination of everybody in our end of the world. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with this, there's a Chevy dealer in, is it oh, Plainview, Nebraska? <laughs> yeah, Pierce, Nebraska. Who, 1,700 people, no stoplights. 1769. Yeah. For years, this guy had bought new cars for his dealership and just stashed them. He would take trade-ins in and not feel right about selling them, so he would stash them. So he had 500 something Chevrolets with low, low miles on them. Some cars with like one to 11 miles on them. I like, I like the it's one. Roll off the yeah. truck. It was incredible. But he let them just rot. A lot of them sat outside. A lot of them just got wrecked in a warehouse. But they had this he's auction. A hoarder. Yeah, he's a hoarder. <laughs> but and it really, it raises a lot of those <laughs> types of. Because he's, he's dead. He's dead. Uh, so Well, you say imagine how much money they made. They, he's dead. He, they sold $2.8 million $2 worth of cars. Million. If you had taken all the money you spent purchasing all of those cars and storing all those cars and invested it, would you have made more than $2.8 million? Totally, because think about where he stored them, on his bean farm. Yeah. You know, and when he, and the stuff that he bought, he, it was like the end of the model year, whatever he had left over, he kept it. That's why it had no miles on it. So back in sixties, seventies, like this was like fifty-eight-ish to yeah, mid seventies. There you go. Yeah, same thing. But the bulk of it was that late fifties, early seventies when right. cars, Chevys were three grand. You know, I mean, a Corvette was six, but you know what I mean. So maybe he would have made money. Well, 
He's dead, but he somebody. Think of this: his kids probably made some money because they were they sold a poster for thirty seven hundred dollars. They were selling yardsticks that had the monogram of the dealership on it for fifty dollars a piece. What'd you What'd you buy? What'd you buy? Nothing. I mean, I, I wanted to go. So we I, I got this was wood. This was Woodstock for Chevy guys. I mean, if you saw the videos, there were twenty thirty thousand people there over two days. So what would you have liked to have taken away from the auction? If, if the, the generous budget from never, Roadkill. Yeah. <laughs> I guess one of them yardsticks, really, for <laughs> using our budget. The thing is, you buy one of those cars I, that has 15 miles on it, what do you do with it? Well, that's the problem. You hose they, it off? They weren't, they weren't crazy special cars. They're, They'll never appreciate in value. For the most part, maybe a couple of them, but like you know, like there was a truck. Do you keep the patina on? And do you hose it off and drive it? And you go, hey, now I've got thirty miles on. Right. I mean, there was like a truck with one mile. I just wanted to sit in some of these that had the plastic still on the seat and, and go, this is what it this is what it was like back then. This is the smell and like I, like I have a I have a fifty five Chevy that I I've, it's gutted. I've never seen what it would have looked like when it was new because there's there's not even a knob. But there. you still wouldn't. It would this is what it smelled like, you know, new yeah, plus it's fifty years in a city. A bean field would be covered in dust. No, 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 because a lot of the, uh, not a lot, but a good portion of these cars were inside the dealership. Were there some good cars to be had there though? There was nothing that was really high-level muscle car. There was no SS 396 or Copo Camaro or anything big. They were pedestrian cars. They were there was a bunch of Corvairs that sold, and you know, 78 Corvettes and 74 Impalas and things like that. But, but they got real money for them. 64 Impalas, you know, yeah, which are yeah, pretty good years 65. for those cars. Yeah, yeah. 65. Desirable body styles, not really rare cars, I would say. There was a lot of cool trucks too. That yeah. Was, that was what I was well, I think the number one seller was that. Uh, 58 Camio. Right, yeah. 58 Camio, 140 grand, something like that. So th that was the one mile. So, so, Johnny, you're against hoarders, are you? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, it's, I, I guess it's a slow news cycle. I think, you know, there's, <laughs> I, 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 like, it's cool. It's cool. There was like 500 old Chevys. And, but when way. hoarders die, it makes for a great story. Yes, <laughs> it does. I just, <laughs> I just sort of, I, it was one of those things where I saw it early on. I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then there was just so much media about it and like never ending. And it was, and I, I guess I don't know. I, I like I know a guy in Colorado with like 600 AMCs, need, need a dozen like horrible Marlins. I know a guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, <laughs> he, oh no 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 no! You have no idea how accurate what you just said is. <laughs> When I grew up, these cars were not on the road, so I've never seen a new stock 58 Cameo. I don't even know what the inside of it looks like. So this was an opportunity. This is why so many people showed up. Time they capsule. were the time capsule. Yeah. That was an opportunity to see what a car looked like back then. I think Covered in dust, obviously, I but guess, I guess part of it is, you know, I was I was at the, the the Gooding auctions at Pebble and like just like auctions Same thing. People just like spend <laughs> no people like spending money. Like 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 there's like the, the values are so out of whack. Like there was there was a bus, like you know, it was like you know, like a, a thirteen window bus went for six figures. And that's mm -hmm. lame. And that keeps people yeah. out of the hobby. And like hundred and forty thousand dollar fifty eight Chevy trucks. Lame. I mean, you know, it's just, it, it, you know, if, if I'm like a kid, I'm like, I could buy an iPhone or a car. I'm buying an iPhone because, you know, it, it, I don't know. So, so you didn't think that Schlumpf Brothers hoarding all those Bugattis was a good idea either? Well, that didn't end too well for them. I mean, he got chased out with pitchforks and torches, you know. He's, yeah, but he, they he, ended he, up with the world's so largest nice. collection of... Oh, which, yeah. which a billionaire, uh, nice, nice guy, good friend of mine, Mr. Mullen, bought, you know, so I, I don't know. You're good friends with a billionaire? Peter Mullen. I, weirdly, <laughs> a couple. I'm not even friends with thousandaires. Wow. <laughs> Billionaire. So I'm constantly staggered, you know, that America is such a big country. The, uh, the number of cars, old cars, that are still tucked away in barns and garages and warehouses around this country. I have no idea. It, yeah. I was just think, there's somebody out there stockpiling Kias and Suzuki. <laughs> no, and, there and is not. Totally. <laughs> there totally is. In 50 years, we'll be back here doing the I same episode. You go. <laughs> you go. That's not. That's not that crazy because I'm, I'm literally these days I'm getting nostalgic for when I had a driver's license and what was on the road and, and, and those are you know, it's like a it's an '89 CRX that I, if I see, if I see one now I'm like hey I had one of those so you've had the expert advice start collecting now today's trash is tomorrow's money <laughs> then and I've that, got a lot of money <laughs> and that's all we've got time for on wide open throttle this week until next week take care bye.